All right, in the previous section, we saw the graphs of the uh, sine and the cosine function. In this section, we're going to graph the other trig functions. And let's start with the tangent function. Okay, now, the tangent is defined as the sine over the cosine. Okay, and so I'm going to use that to get our graph. Now, we're going to make a table of values. All right, and I'm going to start out with, I uh, need a grid here, and start out with theta being 0. Okay, now... Um, we need uh, the tangent of 0, and that's going to be the sine of 0 over the cosine of 0. And the sine of 0 is 1, cosine of 0 is, sorry, a sine of 0 is 0, um, cosine of 0 is 1, and 0 over 1 is 0. So we get 0, 0. And so we get a data point right there. Okay. All right. Now let's uh, take uh, theta as pi. All right. Now, so we're going to need the sine of pi or the cosine of pi. Well, the sine of pi is 0, the cosine of pi is negative 1, which makes this 0 once again. So the tangent of pi is 0. So when theta equals pi, the function equals 0. All right, let's do the same thing for negative pi. Okay, and as can be seen, uh, you know, it's basically the same place as pi, right? So we're going to have the same um, sines and cosines, so that's also going to be 0, and we're going to have a value of 0 there. And it can be seen that there's going to be the same uh, result when theta equals 2 pi or negative 2 pi. So we get some data points such as these. Okay. All right. Now, okay, now let's get some intermediate values for theta. For example, let's take theta equals pi over 4. All right. So the... Um, tangent will be the sine of pi over 4 over the cosine of pi over 4. Sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, as is the cosine. So you can see here that the, that the tangent will result have, will be 1, okay, which we can plot right here. If uh, theta equals pi over 4, the tangent equals 1. Okay, all right, well now um, we can see that it will be negative 1 at negative pi over 2. Okay, that's in quadrant 4, right? And the tangent of negative pi over 4, the cosine being positive and the sine being negative, the tangent will be negative 1. All right? And now let's go to uh, pi over 2. The sine of pi over 2 is 1, and the cosine is uh, 0. And this will result in a value that's undefined. Well, it's kind of hard to graph undefined, right? So we're going to have to take a different approach. We're going to have to we'll see what happens to the tangent as theta approaches. It, when, not when it's equal to pi over 2, but when it approaches pi over 2. Well, when it approaches pi over 2 in quadrant 1, in quadrant 1, both sines and cosines are, um, are uh, positive, right? So the, while the sine gets closer and closer to positive 1, the cosine is 0. The cosine of pi over 2 gets closer and closer to 0. And what that means is the, the quotient will get larger and larger and larger, and it will approach positive infinity. Okay? So this uh, kind of implies an asymptote, doesn't it? So pi over 2 is an asymptote, and the function will approach that asymptote and go up like this. Okay? All right, now let's approach uh, negative pi over 2. All right? Now we're in quadrant 4, and in quadrant 4, the sines are negative while the cosines are positive. But the argument still is the same. As the sine gets closer and closer to negative 1, the cosine gets closer and closer to 0, and it will result in a quotient that approaches negative infinity, which also implies an asymptote. And the function will be shaped like this. Okay? Okay, now if we kind of continue into the into the next section, we can see that it's going to do the same thing here and the same thing over here. And just filling in the diagram, it's going to end up looking like this. And so this is the graph of the tangent function. Now, the uh, parent equation is y is equal to tangent of x. But the general um, function will be this. Okay, where and now what do these letters mean? Well, they kind of mean the same thing for the cosines, uh, sort of. We're going to change amplitude to vertical stretch, but otherwise the A is the vertical stretch, the B is the horizontal shrink, the C is a phase shift, 
Okay, and a D is, is a vertical shift. Okay, all right. I may have said uh, horizontal shift there. I meant horizontal shrink. Okay, it, now note, we have to be careful about this. The period of this function is pi. Notice it repeats itself after values of uh, when theta gets larger by pi. For, if it goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's a pi displacement. And then it repeats itself after that. So this function, the sine and the cosine, had a period of 2 pi, but the tangent function has a period of pi. Okay? And then that's going to bring about this relationship for b. The period is equal to pi over b. Okay? And we're going to be using that a little bit later on. Okay, actually, we'll be using it right now. We're going to um, graph three periods of this function. Okay, now as a visual, I want to have uh, the general relationship. Okay, and so I'm going to identify A and B, and then I also want just a just a visual uh, for the graph so I can kind of transfer from here to its transformed function. Right. All right. Now note that the tangent is zero. I want to get a data point when theta is equal to zero. All right, now the tangent of zero is the same thing as the sine of zero of the cosine of zero. And we already found from the previous stuff that it was zero. Okay, so I can get a point zero, zero right there. Okay. Okay, next place I'm going to go is the period. Okay, now the period pi over b, uh, we, we know that b is equal to two. So this gives a period of pi over two. Note in the original function tangent, it had a period of pi. This has a period of pi over two. Here's the horizontal shrink. This horizontal part has been shrunk down to one half its previous value. So instead of the asymptotes being at negative pi over two and pi over two, they're going to be shrunk down and they're going to be at negative pi over four and positive pi over four. Okay, shrunk down by a factor of two. All right. Okay, we now also know that there's a vertical stretch of 2. Here, that's the A. Okay, so instead of the, the tangent function being... Now, remember what the tangent at pi over 4 was. The tangent of pi over 4 was 1. So that point is right here. But by vertically stretching it by 2, it is no longer at, at, uh, at uh, 1, but now it's at 2. So halfway to pi over 2, this function here was 1, but over here, it's 2 because it's been vertically stretched by 2. Likewise, on this side, where it was, you know, negative pi over 4, um, negative 1, here it's going to be negative 2. All right? <clears throat> and then if we connect the dots, we get something like this. All right? Now, they did want us to graph three periods of this. Okay, this is 1. So I'm going to get a period here and a period there. And that completes this example. Another example. Graph three periods of this function. Okay. There's our general relationship. Okay. I need a parent function as a visual. And now let's identify the stuff. Okay. Right here, I, the A is 1. There's no value for that. There's no value for B. We only have a value of C and D. And C was the phase shift, as you recall. So this is going to be a phase shift of pi over 4 to the left. So this whole function is going to be moved to the left by pi over 4. Now, to get an idea, we're going to do this kind of point by point. So I'm going to take this point at 0, 0, and I'm going to shift it pi over 4 to the left. And so it ends up here. Okay. All right, now... Let's deal with the vertical shift down 1. All right, we already moved it to the left by pi over 4. Now we need to vertically shift this down by 1. So that point is going to go down by 1. Okay. All right, now let's deal with the period. B is equal to 1. And remember, so the period is pi. So the, pi, so the period is unchanged. Because B is equal to 1, that means the period is unchanged. So it has a period of pi. Which makes it a little bit easier. I can I can place these asymptotes uh, pi apart, all right. But they're centered around this point, so I have to move pi over two to the left and pi over two to the right for my asymptotes. 
so they end up here. Okay. Other asymptotes will be there and there. Pi to the right, pi to the left. Okay. All right, now let's place uh, the other, see these other points on the axis of our parent function? We're going to place them here, but remember they've been vertically shifted down. They're between the asymptotes and they're shifted down one. So they're there and they are there. Okay. And then they're going to have the same general shape as this. They just really, this function has just been shifted to the left, pi over four, and then down one. They will have the same general shape. They're not stretched. They're not shrunk horizontally or vertically. They will, they will look the same. They've just been shifted. And that completes this example. Okay, now let's look at the cotangent function. Now the cotangent is defined as the cosine of x over the sine of x. It's the reciprocal of the tangent, right? So let's get a table of values once again. And this time I'm going to choose pi over 2 to, to begin. And the cotangent of pi over 2 will be the cosine of pi over 2 over the sine of pi over 2. And that can be readily seen to be 0 over 1 or 0. So pi over 2 will have a uh, value zero there, as we plot in here. Now, let's go to pi over four. The cosine of pi over four over the sine of pi over four. Both of those are root two over two, and that results in a cotangent of one. And that's going to be right here. Going to three pi over four, which is in quadrant two, the cosine is negative root two over two. The sine is positive root two over two. Their ratio will be negative 1. And so 3 pi over 4 will have a value of negative 1. Okay. And then once again, we uh, really can't go to uh, pi or 0 or negative pi because the sign of, um, of those values is 0. And we get something um, undefined. And so instead, we have to take this approach where we approach these values. Okay, so in these individual quadrants, we have to have that discussion. And so as theta approaches zero in quadrant one, where both of them are positive, the sine um, gets smaller and smaller and smaller as th theta approaches um, zero. And so the function will approach positive infinity. Okay, and so we'll get something like that. As theta approaches, and we have the presence of an asymptote then at x equals 0. As theta approaches pi, okay, once again, the sine gets smaller and smaller and smaller. This time we're in quadrant 2 where the cosines are negative. So something negative over something that gets smaller and smaller and smaller is going to approach negative infinity, which will imply another asymptote at x equals pi, and the function will go like this. Filling in the other periods, okay, we're going to get uh, our zeros there, and the function will repeat itself like that. Okay, then the general function for the cotangent can be written as this, with a, b, c, and d being represented here. Note that the period here is the same as the period for the tangent function. It repeats itself after values of pi. All right, 0 to pi, and then pi to 2 pi, etc. So the period is pi, and then it's related to b by this relationship. All right, let's graph this slightly more complicated example of a cotangent function. All right, as a visual, I want to get the parent function over there so we can see. And we have these um, lo uh, labeled as a, c, and d. Okay, the first thing we want to deal with is... Uh, the phase shift. Now it's important in our previous examples with the tangent we had a point at 0, 0 that we phase shifted. It's important that you focus on the 0 part rather than the point part. Okay so instead of shifting the point this time we're going to shift the asymptote at x equals 0. All right we always deal with the um, x equals 0 um, thing first w whether it's a point or an asymptote we always deal with that first. So we're going to shift the asymptote to the left pi over 4, the asymptote at x equals 0. All right, 
We're going to ship that one first. Then we're going to deal with the um, other asymptotes. Since b is equal to 1, it has a period of pi. So the, so the period doesn't really change. It's just yeah, the asymptotes don't change in, um, in their width. They just change their location by um, pi over 4 to the left. So shift them all pi over 4 to the left. All right, so once again, it's important that you deal with whatever's at x equals 0 first. If it's a point, shift the point. If it's an asymptote, shift the asymptote. Do that first. Okay, now we can shift the points because the points are halfway between the asymptotes. All right, so we can um, shift it. And then notice that we have a vertical shift of, one, of positive 1. So now we're going to vertically shift it. So we place the point between the asymptotes, essentially shifting um, this point, pi over 4 to the right, oh, I'm sorry, to the left, and then we're going to vertically shift it up 1. Okay? Okay, then we deal with the vertical stretch. Last, um, the um, points in the parent function went to pi over 4 to the left and up 1, pi over 4 to the right and down 1. So this time we're going pi over 4 to the left and up 3, and pi over 4 to the right and down 3. So it's, it gets vertically stretched by 3. Okay, And now we can connect, connect the dots. All right. This is one period. We can uh, get a second period over there and a third period here. And that completes this example. Now let's get the graph of the secant function. Uh, the secant function was defined to be 1 over the cosine, right? And we want to get some, some points to, to plot. So what we're going to say, we're going to take a little different approach than the table of values. We're, instead, we're going to send like this. The secant of x is 1 when the cosine is 1. And where is the cosine 1? Well, the cosine is 1 at values of x equals 0, 2 pi, negative 2 pi. And so we can plot these. Okay, now the secant is negative 1 when the cosine is negative 1. And where is the cosine negative 1? The cosine of neg is negative 1 at pi and negative pi. So that gets us here. Now let's talk about when uh, the cosine is 0. When the cosine is 0, we're going to get vertical asymptotes, right, for a denominator of 0. So we're going to get vertical asymptotes when the cosine of x is 0. Where is the cosine of x 0? Cosine of x is 0 at values of pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So that places asymptotes here and here. All right. Now, what happens, uh, what, what happens to the function between these points and the asymptotes? Well, for this, we're going to focus on... Um, as values approach again. Okay, so in quadrants 1 and 4, the cosines are positive. All right, but as x approaches pi over 2, the cosine approaches 0. Okay, and if the cosine approaches 0, then this quotient approaches infinity, and it will be positive infinity because the cosine is positive. So, as, this, as we approach pi over 2, Okay, and negative pi over 2, the function approaches positive infinity. So we're going to get a shape of graph that looks like this. On the other hand, in quadrants 2 and 4, the cosine of x is negative. And so we can make the same argument. As the values of x approach cos, uh, pi over 2, the cosine is once again going to approach 0. But since it's negative, the function will now approach negative infinity, as it will in quadrant 3. So the function does this. And then, filling in the rest, look at this. So this is the secant function. For a general function of secant, we get this with our a, b, c, and d. And note, this is a little bit different from the tangent and cotangent because the period is actually 2 pi. 
notice from, say, negative pi over 2, the function doesn't repeat itself until we get past 3 pi over 2. So we go through a whole, an entire 2 pi before the function repeats itself. So the period is 2 pi. Similar to the cosine function, right? Function of the cosine is 2 pi. Function of, or, sorry, the period of the cosine is 2 pi. And the period of the secant is also 2 pi. And so they follow the same relationship between the period and B. So now let's graph three periods of this function. Okay. For a visual, we get the general function and the parent function. And so now let's say I uh, start identifying things. For one thing, I, I see an A, I see a B, and I see a D, but I don't see a phase shift. So that's nice. We don't have to shift the function to the left or to the right. Next thing I notice is it has a vertical stretch of negative 2. Negative 2. So what that means is it's going to take this point right here that, says, that is at a positive 1, and essentially it's going to multiply it by negative 2. We're going to stretch it by negative 2, so that means it's going to move from positive 1 to negative 2. So all the points are going to be essentially multiplied by negative 2. And now, then we're going to shift it positive 1, because there's a vertical shift, d is equal to 1. Um, so we're going to shift this positive 1, so we're going to move it 1 up to there. All right. Okay, now we need to place the asymptotes once again. b, notice, b is equal to 2. 2 pi over 2 is pi. So now the asymptotes, uh, the period, is now pi. Now remember, the original period was 2 pi. So this represents a horizontal shrink of 2. So where these asymptotes were actually pi apart, we have to shrink those down, and now they're only going to be pi over 2 apart. Horizontal shrink of 2. So instead of being pi over 2 to the left and pi over 2 to the right, they are now pi over 4 to the left and pi over 4 to the right. The period has been shrunk down. So instead of having a period of 2 pi, the period is now pi. Okay? Okay, then we're going, we can take this function and draw it. Remember, it's been vertically stretched by negative 2, so instead of going to positive infinity, they're going to be going to negative infinity instead. All right? And then we can shift some other points. This point, which was at negative 1, is vertically stretched to positive 2 and then shifted positive 1 up to here. All right. And then instead of going to negative infinity, it's going to be going to positive infinity because of the negative sign in front of the in front of the A. All right. OK, they want three periods of this now, so we need to place more asymptotes so like this. All right get corresponding points, okay, sketch them in, and likewise over here. And that completes this example. One more function to talk about, the cosecant function. The cosecant is 1 over the sine, all right? And now we can make the same type of analysis as we did for the secant function. The cosecant is 1 when the sine is 1. Where is the sine 1? Well, that's values of x of pi over 2 and negative 3 pi over 2, for example. So we can get there and there. Where is the cosecant? Negative 1. Well, this is when the sine is negative 1. And the sine is negative 1 at values of negative pi over 2 or positive 3 pi over 2, which we can now graph here. And now talking about when the sine is 0, that will result in vertical asymptotes. The sine is 0 at values of 0 pi blah blah blah. So now I can give values like that for the vertical asymptotes. Okay. 
All right. Now, <clears throat> we do the same type of analysis. We've got to fill in between the point and the asymptotes. In quadrants one and two, the sign is positive, right? So, as x, as x approaches 0 and pi, the sine approaches 0. And if the sine approaches 0, the cosecant approaches positive infinity. All right, so in quadrants 1 and 2, the sine as it, as it approaches, or the uh, function as it approaches the asymptotes is going to go to positive infinity. In quadrants 3 and 4, the sine is negative. So in quadrants 3 and 4, as the function approaches the, as, approaches the asymptotes, it's going to go, it's going to approach negative infinity. And it's going to look like that. All right? <clears throat> and then filling in for the other periods, the parent function is going to look like that. The general function, the general function is going to look like this. All right, and the period once again follows the period of the sine. The period of the sine function is 2 pi, so the period of the cosecant is also 2 pi. And then it follows this relationship between the period and the value of b. Okay, as a final example, we're going to do this uh, of the a slightly more complicated cosecant function. All right, so I'm going to get my visual parent function over here, and this is labeled A, B, and C. Now, the first thing I want to focus is there is a phase shift. I want to focus on that one, okay? And as before, we want to focus on the phase shift of the thing, either the asymptote or a point that is on the y-axis or at x equals zero. Okay, in this case, it's an asymptote. So we're going to phase shift this asymptote to the right. Notice it's to the right because it's um, negative, it's minus pi over 4, so it's a phase shift to the right um, of pi over 4. So we're going to take this asymptote, we're going to shift it to the right by pi over 4. Okay. All right, then I'm going to focus on the period, and <clears throat> the period in this case is pi. So this is a horizontal shrink of 2 once again, where the asymptotes, or the whole function, is shrunk. Um, by half, and this allows us to place the other asymptotes, all right? So remember, the uh, cosecant function has a period of actually 2 pi, going from 0 to 2 pi. 2 pi to goes to the one complete function of the cosecant. It's the same period as the sine function, right? Cosecant's 1 over the sine. Sine has a period of 2 pi, so the cosecant also has a period of 2 pi. Well, now that period is going to be pi. So instead of the um, asymptotes being um, pi apart, now they're going to be pi over 2 apart. Okay, so we're going to place them like this. All right. Okay, next we're going to focus on the points now. And the point to the right of the asymptote that was at x equals 0, the point to the right is, on the, is at positive 1. So we're going to take that point to the right of that shifted asymptote and move it to and place it at positive 1. Okay, now note that had we shifted this point to the right, a, a positive pi over 4, we would have ended up at the wrong place. We would have ended up over here. And this is why we uh, shift whatever's at x equals 0, be it a point or an asymptote, we shift that one first and then work from there. Okay? And this is why. Because if you had placed the point pi over 4 to the right, you would have gotten an incorrect, you're going to end up with an incorrect answer. Okay? So that's why that's why we did that. Otherwise, you would have ended up with the wrong answer. So the order is focus the uh, or shift the object, point or asymptote, um, at x equals 0. Shift that and then work from there. Okay? All right. And so now we have this point. Okay? But we still haven't dealt with the vertical stretch. There's a vertical stretch factor of 2. So instead of being at positive 1, it's going to be at positive 2. Okay? All right, and then we've, cut, we've covered everything. There is no vertical shift. There is no D value. So uh, we're done as far as that stuff goes. And then we, now we can place the other points as like so. Okay, and then draw the function in, and uh, then we're done. This completes this example. Okay, so I want to reiterate. Uh, if you have a phase shift, then, then shift the object at x equals 0 first. 
then focus on the the period to place the other to place the asymptotes okay then place the other points then deal with uh, any stretch and shifting that needs to go on with the with the points well and uh, work from there okay all right now you're in a position to try the uh, practice problems